Okay, uh, we're going to continue on here. Chapter two, we've been talking. Uh, so really, last time we got into uh, waves, we got into some energy calculations as our electrons, again, transition from one energy level to the next. We talked a little bit about Bohr's model of the atom, uh, which is this orbital sort of model, uh, our orbit model, where we have sort of our nucleus. We have these orbits where electrons transition from one energy level to the next in this quantized fashion, like we saw on the sort of our line spectrum, uh, only a certain amount of energy will either be gained or lost in this transition, and they will fully be able to go from one energy level to the next. Again, that can be given off in the form of a photon of light with a specific wavelength. Uh, we could calculate the wavelength or the frequency uh, by using this formula here, where this again is our speed of light. That is our wavelength in meters. That is our frequency in reciprocal seconds or a hertz, which is basically the same thing. Um, <clears throat> and obviously our speed of light is in meters per second. We also saw they could calculate the energy for a photon of light by taking E is equal to H times the frequency. I'll go up here. H times frequency. H being Planck's constant. Uh, which is our 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. Uh, we also can relate both of these equations together by solving for frequency, which is C divided by the wavelength, and taking that and inserting it uh, into our energy. And that gives us E is equal to HC divided by the wavelength. So as we talked about last time, if you know the wavelength or you know the frequency, you will be able to calculate really the energy associated with that photon of light as it comes off. Uh, we also talked about as electrons transition, we could actually calculate the change in energy. And that's minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. That number itself is sometimes referred to as Rydberg constant. And that's 1 over n squared final. Remember, n is the principal quantum number, which is really the energy level. Minus 1 over n squared initial here. This energy is also the same one, which means if you figure that, you could set it equal to H times the frequency or HC over the wavelength. So again, you could kind of tie all those sort of equations together. So I hit the button there. Any questions on that? We did a lot of practicing there during lab doing some of these calculations. Any questions? <clears throat> all right. So uh, we've been talking about Bohr's model. And again, remember that this idea of quantized energy is sort of that staircase sort of model we were talking about, where again, electrons, just like as you walk upstairs, will really only gain or lose energy, enough energy to fully make those transitions represented by e equals H times the frequency. Again, just like when you walk upstairs, uh, you won't stop halfway between steps. Here, neither will electrons stop halfway between sort of energy levels or anything like that. They will fully do that transition. As an electron becomes more tightly bound, its energy is more negative. And as the electron is brought closer to the nucleus, energy is released from the system. So again, that means that our electron is dropping from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. It's the only way it can get closer to the nucleus. And that's what we talked about is an exothermic process for the atom. It has to release that energy, right? As we have law of conservation of energy. Just like going the opposite way, when the electron goes from a lower energy level to a higher, that is an endothermic process. It has to absorb that energy again, kind of like what we did with the electrical current, the flame, when we added the heat, it excited all those uh, electrons in there as the atom basically gained energy. In terms of energy, as we also talked about, right, uh, representation of sort of uh, electrons uh, exothermic and endothermic. If a process is exothermic and releases energy, again, you should end up with a negative value for energy. And if it's a endothermic process, which it absorbs energy, you should end up with a positive value for energy. Remember, the other important thing in those calculations is 
again, we do want to get rid of the negative sign in energy if there is one, if we're going to kind of use that uh, number to calculate something like the frequency or the wavelength, which should be a positive number. So again, we do keep the negative on the energy to indicate exothermic or endothermic. But uh, if we need to use that number to calculate something else like wavelength or frequency, uh, we sort of get rid of it. And again, um, make a positive wavelength and our frequency. Now, the Bohr model, as we talked about, works really well to describe really those four lines that we see in hydrogen, uh, which you did. You looked at hydrogen, I think, on Tuesday. Um, and when we get to, though, more electrons than what hydrogen has, which is one. Thank you. Uh, it really doesn't hold up all that well. Uh, electrons don't also move around in pretty circles. So the idea in Bohr where we have these fixed orbits, and again, an electron is traveling around these orbits so predictably that you could like put your finger there if you could and wait for it to just come around the circle. Uh, again, electrons really don't travel that way as we'll talk about. We really do eventually move away from this model of Bohr to a more quantum mechanical model where electrons are really randomly sort of moving about uh, that empty space within the atom. <clears throat> All right, so let's practice calculations one more time for good measure. So for each of these transitions, let us uh, calculate the uh, change in energy. Why don't you also calculate the wavelength? And why don't you also calculate the frequency? You do, yeah. So, uh, so call. Yeah. Tips on, uh, yeah, so, uh, so uh, just so we're clear, constant values like uh, uh, Planck's constant or speed of light will be provided for you. But formulas like uh, C is equal to wavelength times the frequency, that will not be provided for you. Or E equals H times the frequency, that stuff will not be provided. But uh, the speed of light, uh, like Planck's constant, those type of... Second, so pop it over here. So we're going uh, N is equal to 5 to N is equal to 2. So clearly this is the equation we use, obviously, pretty extensively there in lab. Uh, that's going to be our change in energy is going to be equal to our Rydberg constant with the negative here. Um, and again, one over our final energy level minus one over our initial. Uh, so we're going to pop that in there. It's going to be minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Our final is two. So that will be one over four, which is two squared minus our initial, which is five. So that'll be one over 25, which again is five squared in that case. And if we do all that good stuff, uh, one divided by four minus one divided by 25 would be better. Times 2.18 to the minus 18. Uh, that'll get us something like negative uh, 4.58 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Here we do get a negative value, which we expect as the electron is dropping from a higher energy level to a lower. So it has to be exothermic for the atom to release that energy to allow that to happen. Any questions on that part there? Now we have a couple of options in terms of what we could go after next, since we're also looking for wavelength or frequency. You can go right into here to get to your frequency, but if you wanted to do the wavelength, uh, you could also go into here and use that equation to get the wavelength. So it really doesn't matter which one you kind of go after first. They all should give you the same answer. I'm going to go with frequency. So to do that, I'm going to go E is equal to H times the frequency. Remember, H is our Planck's constant, which is a constant value that you always have. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. Those are joules times seconds. I'm going to uh, rearrange this first before I plug it in, and that's going to give me E divided by H. So I'm going to pop my energy above that there, which is what I should have there. So that's going to be 4.58 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Again, here we're going to get rid of the negative so we don't end up with a negative uh, frequency. So we'll go that way, I guess, is a better way of doing that. There we go. Uh, so uh, we got uh, 4.58 to the negative 19. 
divided by 6.63 to negative 34. Again, definitely want to make sure you're using your exponent button. 6.91 times 10 to the 14. Units here, joules on top, joules on the bottom cancel. Leaves us reciprocal seconds, which is also a hertz in this case. At this point, you still have actually two options for how you could get the wavelength. You still could go into here with your energy value, if you like. Or at this point, since we just got the frequency, we could also use this other equation and solve for wavelength. So again, you do have a couple of options. I'm going to go with wavelength and actually solve for it this time. We're going to divide that over. And I'm going to put in there my speed of light. And I'm going to divide it by the frequency there. The seconds will cancel. That's actually going to leave me my wavelength in meters is what we're going to end up with here. Uh, so I got uh, 3 to the 8 divided by that. And that's going to give me 4.34 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Since this is really visible light, we could actually convert that to our friend nanometers, which is very commonly how these are given. And again, remember that nano is 10 to the minus 9. So that means, again, in one nanometer, one of the prefix units, there's 10 to the minus 9 meters. So again, that is the correct way to use that. 10 to the minus 9 meters on the bottom, one nanometer on the top. We're basically going to divide that number by 1 times 10 to the minus 9. And that will give us 434 nanometers in this case. Maybe bluish in terms of color. I guess I chose the right color. They're kind of bluish would be the color in this case. Yeah. Question on any of those calculations. Clearly, obviously, exactly what we did on Tuesday. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. I would assume so. As long as you have the rest of the number, it'd be okay. You got the type set to 14 part, it should be okay, yeah. So if you're slightly off with rounding, it's not a big deal. But if you're significantly off with rounding, then obviously it is a big deal. And that happens. Again, personally, normal rules apply when you're doing these type of calculations or really any calculations, which is you really don't want to round to the very end. So personally, just so you know how I do it, if you want to kind of get the same answer, I probably will get... I honestly just keep rolling with the whole of the numbers in my calculator and just kind of keep on with the calculation. Um, but if you do round, normal rules apply, which means you really should keep a couple extra digits so you don't get any type of rounding error. But if you're just off slightly like that, you should be okay. Yeah. If you got a negative, are you talking about the uh, entire numbers negative or like a negative exponent? number so like like you had a negative here yeah. yeah so it doesn't matter you should never really have a negative frequency or a negative wavelength uh and again that's why we always just sort of drop the negative from the energy value just to make sure that we don't end up with that there's a long story but basically you know you kind of think of it as you know that's the energy associated with the uh with the photon that's coming off and you could then make it positive if you think about what the atom sort of absorbing so um, you just want to make sure that you always end up with a positive wavelength or frequency. Energy, you should always keep the negative if there is a negative. Don't put it there if there's not. But if you do get a negative number for energy, that's really important for the energy value, as we talked about before, to indicate what's happening in terms of exothermic or endothermic. But you should never really end up with a, a negative wavelength or frequency. Yeah. So the simple answer is just drop it off if you're going to continue on and use it with a calculation. Other questions? All right, let's take a look at the next one, which I think is four to uh, I think it's four to two, if I'm not mistaken. N equals four to N equals two. Uh, so again, we're going to start with what we got going on, uh, which is our change in energy. So again, minus our Rydberg's constant, our RH there. Again, one over our final, which is two squared, which is four minus one over our initial, which is four squared, which is 16 in this case. Once again, we are transitioning from higher energy level to lower. We should expect a negative value here for our energy 
and we should get a negative value. And in this case, we get a negative four point, and we'll call it 09 times 10 to the minus 19 joules in this case. Yeah. Once again, exothermic negative value. And just like we just talked about and did, at this point, we're going to use this number and pretty much ignore the negative so we don't get any more negative values. Uh, just to mix it up, why not? I will use E is equal to HC over the wavelength and go after wavelength first this time. That means if I rearrange it, I'm sending this guy to that side and E back to the other side gives you the wavelength is equal to HC divided by the energy. As that goes there, this goes there. And uh, we end up with something like that. Here, those are both constants up on top. So that's our Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Our speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by, again, our positive value here for our energy. Joules are going to cancel. Seconds are going to cancel. And that's going to uh, leave us with meters as our unit of wavelength here. And that will give us 6.63 to the minus 34 times 3 to the 8 divided by 4.09 to the minus 19. Uh, that's going to get us a 484.86 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Once again, I'm uh, going to change it to nanometers because this is visible part of the spectrum. I know that because they're asking what colors, I think, in the question. So we got uh, 10 to the minus 9 meters is a nanometer. So we got like 486 nanometers. Maybe greenish, orangish type color. We can't pick the right color, so we'll go with that for orangey. Uh, at this point, we could get to our frequency. And once again, we still have two options as to how to do that. You can either use this equation or you can use, obviously, this equation. I'll go with uh, the last equation there, which is our C divided by our wavelength. Remember though, we do need to use the wavelength correctly here. And what I mean by that is because our speed of light's in meters, we actually need to use the meters version of it, not the nanometers. So everything cancels out correctly. That's gonna give us our 4.86 times 10 to the minus seven meters. Meters will cancel and that's gonna get us here uh, 6.17 times 10 to the 14 reciprocal seconds are a hearse. Any questions on those calculations there? So as you can see, it really doesn't matter which one you kind of go after first. As long as you did calculation correctly, you should end up with the same number as long as you have the information. All right, and then lastly here... Uh, Again, uh, we got uh, three to two, looks like our final transition. So N is equal to three to N is equal to two, starting the same way, minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Final is two, so that is two squared, which is four, minus initial, which is three, three squared is nine in this case. Again, we should expect a negative value for energy as we're dropping energy levels. And we're going to get a negative 3.03 .03 times 10 to the minus 19 joules in this case. Any questions on that one there? So uh, we'll go frequency on this one first. Why not? E is equal to H times the frequency. So frequency would be E divided by H in this case, sending this to the other side. And then we would have our positive value there for energy divided by our Planck's constant. Again, the joules are gonna cancel. That's gonna leave us reciprocal seconds. So uh, we'll do a 6.63 to the minus 34. Yeah, 4.57 times 10 to the 14 reciprocal seconds. And lastly here, we could get our wavelength. C is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. Wavelength equal C divided by the frequency and pop it in our numbers here for each of those.
here. We'll go 4.57 times 10 to the 14 reciprocal seconds. Those reciprocal seconds will cancel, leaving us meters when it's all said and done. So 3 to the 8 divided by that answer. Going to give us a 6.57 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Once again, we will convert this guy into our nanometers. And that's a 657 nanometers. As you might guess, that would be red. I'm assuming it has, I wrote red there. Any questions on any of those calculations? Clearly, you need to be able to do all those calculations. Once again, that's the earlier question. Uh, Planck's constant, constant values will be provided. But again, you are responsible to know, you know, these equations. Yeah. And these guys, yeah. <clears throat> Any questions on that? I guess we should also answer the question, which I think was, which one has the longest wavelength, which I believe is this one we're looking at, which is red, right? Uh, by the way, we also see if we look at these transitions, what we were talking about uh, the other day. And what I mean by that is uh, this is a kind of one energy level transition. This is a couple of energy level transitions, right? And this is a few energy level transitions. The five to two is the greatest number of transitions, which means it probably should have a lot more energy, which if we look at the number there, 4.58 versus 4.09 versus 3.03, .03. it has the most energy being given off. And what we know in terms of the energy given off, right? If it's high in energy, the wavelength should be long or short be short and that's what we see when we look at the wavelengths of this this guy has the lowest energy to transition longer wavelength if we look at the very first guy there he had the biggest transition highest energy shortest wavelength so again all those things that we talked about you can see sort of in these calculations any questions about there all right So uh, what we're going to talk about now is this idea of sort of moving away from Bohr's model of the atom. I guess 46 is more green than orange. <clears throat> um, and what happened along the way after Bohr's sort of model um, is we have this idea brought about by de Broglie. And it has a lot to do with the idea of what we were talking about, which is the kind of dual nature of light where uh, waves can have particle-like function and particles could have wave-like functions. And de Broglie actually came up with this idea that, oh, I'll go back there, that again, a particle, for example, like an electron, uh, could have this sort of wave characteristics. And he also predicted the particles as well can have, again, a wave-like function. And he thought of sort of a particle as a uh, having a wave-like function like a standing wave. And the idea of a sort of a standing wave is like on a guitar string, right? You could pluck that thing and you'll get a wave but your string's not going to go anywhere, right? It's kind of tied to the guitar, right? But you can still make the wave. And that's sort of what is referred to as a standing wave. So instead of this idea of electrons sort of moving these pretty orbits around the nucleus, his sort of theory was that, you know, it's going to be tied to the nucleus's positive charge. And these particle, wherever it may be, will have some of that wave-like characteristics where it's sort of like held on to the atom and just doesn't float away like a wave because it's attracted to the nucleus. And that's why, again, certain ones, electrons are involved, for example, in bonding and other ones aren't, but there's this wave-like standing function uh, that the electrons sort of have this wave-like character and they, they're kind of tied to the atom through that attractive force uh, to the nucleus. So that brings us to uh, an equation, which is sometimes referred to as the de Broglie wavelength. 
He, by the way, never did any experiments on this. He actually just theorized it. And later people did experiments and again, sort of proved he was correct in that sense. So the wavelength here is equal to H divided by M times V, which is the velocity. So the de Broglie wavelength is equal to H, M, and V, which is the velocity here. Now there's an important relationship that doesn't really affect necessarily the calculation in a sense, but you do have to understand that a joule, for example, is equal to a kilogram meter squared over second squared. So one joule is equal to those units. And those units is what we use here when we look at H. H is joules per second. Here we will need the mass in kilograms to cancel out correctly. And our velocity has to be in meters per second. The reason for that is if we substitute this in for the joules and we just look at the units, we get the wavelength is equal to a kilogram meter squared second squared. And that's the joule part of it, basically. There is still a second, which I'm not sure if they're on your notes or not, but if not, make sure you add the second there. And that means that when we do our mass, we don't need it in grams, but we do need it in kilograms. And again, our velocity in meters per second. So that when we start canceling out, we got a second there and a second there. That gets rid of all those. Kilogram here, kilogram here gets rid of that. One meter gets rid of that. And that leaves us just a meter that's left over. The good news is H is still 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. It's just that you got to remember that you really the mass here is the important one. You have to get the mass into kilograms for everything to cancel out correctly. If you leave it in grams, uh, you'll be off by a factor, obviously, of a thousand in that case. So that's the important part of it. Everything else is the same. And also, whatever they might get you in terms of velocity, uh, in terms of units, you do need to get it to meters per second. So if they give it to you like miles per hour, you got to do a little conversion to get it to meters per second so that again, everything properly cancels out. So what this equation actually allows you to do is actually calculate uh, the wavelength for like a particle, like an electron, a proton, golf ball, whatever it may be. You could calculate basically the wavelength of a particle like that and kind of look at its wave-like character. So why don't we try that, uh, calculate the wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength of an electron that's traveling at 2.65 times 10 to the six meters per second. There is the mass of an electron, nine. Okay, so let's take a look at, we're going to calculate the de Broglie wavelength, which is H over M times B. In this particular example, actually everything they gave us is in the proper units. Again, if they was not in kilograms, you do need to make sure you convert the mass to kilograms. And again, if the velocity was not in meters per second, you would also need to convert that one to meters per second. H is still our Planck's constant, which is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Remember again, a joule is a kilogram meter squared second squared, which means H is really in this case, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. Again, kilograms, meters squared, second squared, uh, times seconds. So again, those are the units that we're really going to use. So we put it in here. Our wavelength will be our 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. Once again, using those units. Divided by our mass, which was given to us in kilograms and not grams. So that's good. And our velocity here of our particle at times 10 to the six meters per second. Again, here uh, we got uh, seconds and seconds are gonna cancel. Uh, we got kilograms gonna cancel. We got one of those meters gonna cancel. That is again, going to leave us meters as our unit that's left over at this point. And that will get us uh, 6.63 to the minus 34 divided by 9.11 to the minus 31 hit equals divided by 2.65 to the six. Definitely want to make sure you're using your exponent button. And we will get a uh, wave length here of 2.75 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. 
uh, which is now the wavelength here of a particle like an electron. So again, a particle like an electron has a significant sort of wavelength associated with it, even though it is, again, a particle. Any questions on that there? <laughs> So the idea here, as we talked about earlier, uh, is that we are trying to sort of move away uh, from Bohr's model of atom, this sort of planetary model where we have these orbits, where electrons, which are particles, are just kind of moving around these pretty circles, uh, to this idea that, hey, particles can have wave-like function, which means they can move around space-like waves and sort of a randomness. They're tied to the nucleus as there's an attractive force there. Uh, between the nucleus and those negatively charged electrons. So what this means is we are moving to this more wave mechanical model of the atom, this quantum mechanical model of the atom. And again, we're kind of moving on from Bohr's model of the atom at this point. And another major sort of step to the idea of we really don't know how a particle like an electron is moving, unlike in Bohr's model where we can kind of predict how it's moving, is the idea that was brought about by Heisenberg and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And basically the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that there is a limitation to how well you know at any given point in time where a particle is, its position, and you also don't know at any given point in time how a particle is basically moving. And really, the more you know about, say, how a particle is moving, the less you know about exactly where it's hanging out, and vice versa. The more you know about where it's located, the less you know about sort of how it's moving, hence the uncertainty part of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. That is basically what we have here. That's the uncertainty in the position of a particle. That is the uncertainty in the momentum or how it's moving. It's greater than or equal to Planck's constant times four times pi, if you ever want to do the calculation. But this is the idea of a particle like an electron. We cannot know for sure that it's in this orbit and it's moving around nice and pretty circles uh, that sort of violates the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And again, the more that we know about a particle's movement, the less we know about where it's located. So we slowly are moving away from Bohr's model of orbits to, as we'll talk about in a second, to this idea of atomic orbitals where electrons are sort of housed. Another major sort of step towards that was done by a guy named Schrodinger, and he had wave function calculations. And you can do wave function calculations. If you ever take physical chemistry, you'll do a bunch of them. It's kind of a bunch of calculus and derivatives and fun stuff like that. Uh, but the idea that sort of came out of this Schrodinger and his equations and wave function is definitely moving away from certainty of how like a particle like an electron is moving to the best that you could do is go, I think there's probably a fairly high probability that in this part of the atom, there should be an electron. Now with the idea of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, the idea is although there may be a really high probability of finding an electron in a particular location in the atom, you still have really no idea how, where it is, and you really still don't have a really good idea of how it's moving. You just know that, hey, there's a, there's a fairly good chance to find an electron in this sort of area. And that's what we are moving away towards is more of a probability sort of map and a probability idea of there is a high probability in this part of the atom that there should be electrons there. And again, not really sure where they are exactly, not really sure exactly how they're moving, but you know, eventually one should show up at some point moving around in that area. So when we think about the atom, where should be probably the highest probability of finding an electron? Opposites attract, right? So the nucleus is positively charged because it has protons, which means again, negatively charged electrons, there should be a relatively high probability of finding an electron near the nucleus, right? 
as you sort of fan out from the nucleus at some distances, the probability starts to decrease, right? Because you're further away from that attractive force. So there is a less probability of finding an electron out in those areas. Does that mean you can't find an electron there? No, you can find an electron there. It just means there's probably a lesser chance that you're going to find an electron out in that area than closer to the nucleus where there's going to be definitely a, a lot higher probability of finding an electron. So that is what we're looking at here with this sort of wave function. You can think of right here in the center as the nucleus. And this is what is sometimes referred to as an electron density map. And this is really that when we talked about in terms of Rutherford's model of the atom, that's that empty space we're talking about, right? That all those alpha particles flew around. In that empty space is where those electrons are moving. They're moving fairly randomly about that empty space. But you can see the much darker area, maybe on the screen you can, is closer, obviously, to the nucleus. And again, as you sort of fan out, that kind of bluish color gets a little bit lighter and stuff like that. Again, just means a lower probability of finding it. And that's what that map here or this graph shows. Much closer to the nucleus, there's a pretty good probability that you're going to come across an electron. And again, as you sort of fan out, there's a lot less of a probability of coming across an electron. And that's what we see here. So what happens is we definitely move away from Bohr's idea of orbits to this quantum mechanical idea of really probability maps of we find electrons in the atom in orbitals. And you might be familiar with these. These are what are referred to as atomic orbitals. And those are our S's, our P's, our D's, and our F's that you perhaps did electron configuration with, right? And these are really the S, the P, the D, the F. These are really just probability maps of where you would likely find an electron in an atom. Do they exist in the shapes that we're going to see in a second? Probably not. But again, just sort of the idea of uh, theoretically finding it. So again, we're sort of doing a quantum mechanical sort of model, as I mentioned, where random sort of movements, I guess we'll back it up that way as well, uh, of the electron around that nucleus. And again, highest probability near the nucleus, little less of a probability as you move out. So let's take a look actually at the orbitals first. So I'm just going to kind of jump a little ahead here and then we will come back to. Okay. So when we talk about atomic orbitals, um, as you may be familiar with when you did electron configuration, they do begin on different energy levels, these different sort of atomic orbitals. And remember that N, which is our principal quantum number, is basically the energy level. So on the N equals 1, which is the lowest in energy, that is where we first start to see S orbitals appear. And S orbitals are essentially just a sphere. And it's kind of like with that graph we just looked at. You can think of the uh, kind of nucleus in the middle. And again, that higher probability here near the nucleus. And again, it gets a little smaller probability as you back it out. Now, starting on the very first energy level, you have S orbitals. And you will have S orbitals on every energy level after that. So there's an S orbital on each of them. On the first energy level, it's referred to as a 1S orbital. On the second energy level, it's a 2S orbital. Third energy level, 3S orbital. That is basically what this first number means when you write something like electron configuration. That is the N number. That is the energy level. That's the quantum number there, principal quantum number. They just actually just get uh, bigger to accommodate all the electrons that are coming in as you go from one energy level to the next to accommodate all those electrons come down there. And that's what we see here again. Uh, you can think of the nucleus in the middle, and again, just gets a little larger as you go down there to accommodate all those electrons, a 1s, 2s, and 3s orbital. And again, this is basically what it looks like, just kind of a sphere. orbital has a spherical shape with the nucleus at the center. Right. Now, the next sort of orbitals that we have don't come about until you get to the second energy level. 
So when you get to the second energy level, as we just talked about, you still have an S orbital, which is a 2S orbital. This is where we start to see our P orbitals basically begin. Now, when we talk about orbitals, and just going back here to uh, our S orbital for a second here. When we talk about our S orbital, there really is only one type of S orbital. So no matter what energy level you're at, there's really only one type of S orbital. And when we talk about atomic orbitals, any individual atomic orbital could hold a maximum of two electrons. So any individual atomic orbital that you have will hold only a maximum of two electrons, which means any S orbital, because there's only one type of S orbital, the maximum number of electrons that each of those S orbitals can hold is just two. If each of those arrows represent an electron, they basically could hold only two of them. But when we get to P orbitals, there's actually three different types of P orbitals that there are, and I'll take a look at that. There, there are three types of P orbitals. There's the PX, the PY, and the PZ orbital, the X, Y, and Z, basically their orientation in three-dimensional space. Now, that means that if you take all three of these orbitals on a particular energy level, they are sometimes referred to as a subshell or a sublevel, depending on your book or who's writing it, subshell or sublevel. So this is sometimes referred to, for example, as the 2P subshell. The 2P subshell is made up of three individual P orbitals, the PX, the PY, and the PZ on different coordinate planes there the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. That means this guy right here, the px, could hold uh, two electrons, the py could hold two electrons, and the pz orbital could hold two electrons, which means if you fill up the entire 2p subshell, uh, you could get in there a maximum of six electrons if you filled up that entire 2p subshell. Again, two electrons into each maximum here. You could think of the nucleus being there in the center and the highest probability of probably finding an electron is kind of in those areas of those guys. Uh, where the nucleus is, is sometimes referred to as a node. If you think about uh, De Broglie and that standing wave, there are certain parts of the wave that has no amplitude and that is what is sometimes referred to as a node. And you can kind of think of with this wave-like characteristic that's tied to the nucleus, kind of where the nucleus is, is sort of like the node is sort of like no amplitude. And again, shooting out from there is that wave-like characteristic of things like electrons. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so here's our two PX. The two PX orbital is in the shape of a figure eight along the X axis. And there's our Y on the Y. The 2PY orbital is in the shape of a figure eight along the y-axis. And that is sometimes how the shape is referred to, sort of like a figure eight, and then obviously our, X, our Z here on the z-axis. The 2PZ orbital is in the shape of a figure eight along the z-axis. And as you can see here, the next set of orbitals actually do not start until you get to the third energy level. So remember on the first energy level, that is where we start to see S's. When we get to the second energy level, we have S orbitals and that's the first appearance of P orbitals. And it's not until you get to the third energy level that you start to see D orbitals. And there actually are five different types of D orbitals. And as you can see here, these are the five different types of D orbitals. Each one of these d orbitals could basically hold two electrons. So this guy could hold two, this could hold two, this could hold two, two, and two. My math is not bad there. That is five times two, which is a maxing out of 10 electrons if you max out the d subshell. And again, this would be considered a subshell or sublevel, all five of those individual orbitals together. 
do you have to fill all all the five orbitals? You don't. You just fill what you need. But uh, they have the ability that subshell to hold uh, ten electrons total. Here you can think of it. They mostly look like two uh, p orbitals together. You think of the nucleus kind of being there, and again you can see highest probability of finding electrons near that nucleus. Once again, as you sort of fan out from that area, it gets a little less of a probability of sort of happening here as these orbitals are really just, as I said before, sort of probability maps of finding electrons. Now, the last, or here's our Ds. Take a look at them. Y squared orbital has a cloverleaf shape that lies in the XY plane and is aligned along the X and Y axes. The 3D X squared minus Y squared orbital has a cloverleaf shape that lies in the XY plane and is aligned along the X and Y axes. The 3D XY orbital has a cloverleaf shape that lies in the XY plane and bisects the X and Y axes. And we'll do the last one here. It's got like a donut shape. That's good. The 3D Z squared orbital is shaped like a PZ orbital with a donut of electron density around the center. It is aligned with the z-axis. Now, the last sort of set of orbitals that we usually come across, again, do not appear until you get to the fourth energy level. So again, S's start on the first. P's don't begin until the second energy level. D's begin on the third energy level. And now F's begin actually here on the fourth energy level. And F orbital, there's actually seven different types of F orbitals. And as you can see here in this picture, this is our seven. That means that if you fill the F subshell, you can max out with 14 electrons, right? And you can max them out. Again, you can see they're kind of a combination of a couple of D orbitals together on most of them. And uh, again, they lie in three dimensional space in sorted, certain orientations. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> yes, sir. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, so we're not going to get obviously deep into that, but again, it's sort of, uh, you're, you're correct that in the low uh, calculus and some probability uh, type of maps and stuff like that. Um, for us, in terms of the shape, you definitely should know what the shape of an S orbital looks like. You should really know what the shape of a P orbital looks like. And, you know, the, the D orbitals kind of looks like a couple of P orbitals together. I think it's good. I'm not going to have you draw them or anything like that. Uh, what you really need to know, mainly for our purposes here in chemistry, is uh, you do need to know uh, what energy level they each start at. You need to know how many individual orbitals each of them have. And obviously, you need to know if you max out, you know, the subshell. Um, how much, uh, how many electrons you could put in there. Now, we did talk about sort of subshells and levels. So, again, just to sort of reiterate here, um, you know, on the, let's do it here. On the N equals one level, we really only have a 1S sort of orbital. It's the only thing on the first energy level, let's say S orbital. When we go to the second energy level, which again is higher in energy, remember that as we go above n equals one, n equals two, three, four, five, six, seven, those are excited states further away from the nucleus. We have our 2s orbital, and that is where we start to see our 2p subshell basically appear. On the third energy level, we again have a 3s uh, orbital. We also have a set of 3p subshell. And that's when we first start to see our 3D subshell up here. And on the N equals 4, we have our 4S. We have our 4P. We have our 4D. And again, this is where we start to see our 4F basically start to appear. Now, we talked a little bit about terminology in terms of if you take a grouping which is really your P, your D, and your F orbitals, a grouping of the same type of orbitals on the same energy level. They're referred to as a subshell or sublevel. Another terminology sometimes used is shell or level. 
and that is like everybody on the n equals one level for example or n equals two level so when we talk about a shell or a level we're talking about everything on the entire energy level so for example if i want to know the maximum number of electrons if i filled up all the orbitals on the n equals two shell how many total electrons could i do if i filled them all up The answer is eight, right? Maximum electrons. That is two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, right? If I filled up that entire thing. Now, if I filled up the 2P subshell, the maximum number of electrons would be? It'd be that those set right there, right? So that would be six electrons, right? That you filled in there. So you want to be careful on some of the terminology. So for example, if I filled up the uh, N equals three shell was the maximum number of electrons. If I filled the 4D subshell was the maximum number of electrons. And if I filled a 4P orbital, what is the maximum number of electrons? So take a moment and answer each of those questions. So how many maximum electrons are filled up to N equals three level, a 4D subshell, and a 4P orbital? All right, let's take a look. So uh, if I filled the N equals three uh, shell or level, that means that is everybody on this, right? So that is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 electrons there if I max out everybody in that case. How about if I fill the 4D subshell? How many electrons would that be? It would be 4D subshell is just this set of D orbitals on the fourth energy level which means one, two, three, four, five, five times two is 10, yeah. If I did the four, uh, the N equals four level or shell, that would be everybody on that, right? And how about a 4P orbital? That is, it is actually two, right? Any individual orbital could hold two electrons. Could be this one, right? Could be that one. Could be that one. Could be any one of those. So only two for those. If I said how much to fill the 4P subshell, it would then be six, right? Because that's all of them together in that case. So you want to be careful on that. By the way, if you don't want to count it all like that, and you want to know the maximum number of electrons on a shell or level, you could take two times n squared and be in the energy level. So for example, we did this one, two squared is four, four times two is eight. We just did this one, three squared is nine, nine times two is 18. Yeah, so it's a real quicker way to doing it than drawing it out. If you're just interested in how many electrons you put in there, you wanna square the n number first and then multiply it by two. Yeah, so you wanna make sure you do it that way. And that will give you the maximum number of electrons if you filled up an entire shell or level any questions on orbitals all right so i did want to talk about the orbitals first we're now going to go back and talk about really why we have these orbitals why we have these orbitals on certain energy levels uh you know why they don't maybe appear on all right so we're going to next talk about quantum numbers and there are really four quantum numbers that uh, we deal with and they really are the basis for, like I said, you know, why we have these kind of orbitals on this energy level and how many we have and sort of their orientation, orientation in three-dimensional space. The first one is the one we've been talking about for a number of time here. That is the principal quantum number. That is N. N can have values of one through seven, as we talked about before. One is the ground state, the closest to the nucleus, the lowest in energy. Obviously, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, as we've talked about, are higher in energy level, further away from the nucleus. The angular momentum quantum number, which is L, is really the shape of the atomic orbitals. To be honest with you, it really tells you what 
atomic orbitals are available on a particular energy level. So that's essentially what that will tell you, the L value. L could have values of 0 to n minus 1, all kind of whole number integers there. So starting with your n values, subtract it from 1, go from 0 to whatever number you get, and that is the L values that are possible on a particular energy level. It also will tell you pretty much, like I said, are you dealing with like an S orbital, P, D, F, G, whatever it may be. The next quantum number is the magnetic quantum number, which is the M sub L. And that really is the orientation of those orbitals in three-dimensional space. Like we saw, there's like a PX orbital on the X axis, there's a PY on the Y, there's a PZ on the Z axis. The M sub L can have values that run from minus L to zero to plus L. Again, all sort of whole numbers as you go from one to the next. So for every single L value that you have, you could actually have a run of M sub L values. The last uh, quantum number is the spin quantum number. which got separated from the rest of the slides is down the road on your notes there. And that's M sub S. And that gives you the spin of the electrons within the orbital. Electrons are affected by electrical fields. They have spin. And it can have values of basically plus or minus one half. Now, when we talk about electrons in a orbital, and if my box represents an orbital, and my arrow represents an electron, an arrow that first goes into the orbital will kind of be pointing in the upwards direction. And that is what is referred to as having plus one half in terms of a spin. Now, an arrow pointing downward in an orbital will have what is known as minus one half in terms of a spin. So those are the orientations uh, of the electrons within the orbital here. These four quantum numbers basically are what determines your electron configuration that you've written probably before, again, where the orbitals are. So to sort of show you how it relates to the orbitals and the energy levels, let's go through some of these here and kind of see what we're looking at. We'll come back to that. So let's just start with the basis, which is I'm on the first energy level, which is n is equal to 1. Right? Now, when we talk about L, L again can have values of 0 to n minus 1 in this case. Right? Now, obviously, n minus 1 is 1 minus 1, which means the only value we can have on the very first energy level is an L value of 0. Maybe not surprisingly enough, an L value of zero represents a S orbital. So if you get an L value of zero, that represents an S orbital. That is the one S orbital that's basically hanging out there on the very first energy level. Now that one S orbital can have an M sub L value that runs from minus L to zero to plus L. In this case, clearly, since L is zero, it could only run to zero, which basically tells you there's actually less like one S orbital on that energy level. There's no other numbers. Basically, just have one number, one S orbital is present. That's why when we look at an S orbital, there's just one of them, no matter where you're at. And it could hold two electrons, obviously. The two electrons that can be held within that orbital is plus or minus a half, which means Within that 1s orbital, you can have an electron going in those directions, basically, on there. Any questions on that there? Now, if we get to the second energy level, n is equal to 2, what are, could be the values of L? L could be what values here? It could be 0. And n minus 1, in this case, would be 
one, right? Two minus one is one, yeah? So it could have values of zero to n minus one. So in this case, n is two. So two minus one is one, and it could have a value of zero. That means that on the second energy level, we already know we have an L now that is zero, and that zero represents what orbital? S. That's why on the second energy level, we also have a 2s orbital hanging out. But now we have an L value of 1, which represents our p subshell, basically. And that is where we see our p orbitals first start to appear. That's why they are restricted from sort of appearing on the first energy level based on quantum numbers. They should only start to pop out there on the second energy level. Now, for each of these individual L values, we can do an M sub L value. So we obviously did the zero above. So for this particular one, the M sub L would only be zero, which is our one S orbital, basically. Not the one S over one individual S orbital that's hanging out there. Now for this P subshell, we can do M sub L for that particular value of L. And for that particular value of L, it could go from minus L so in this case, minus one is our first value. It could then go to zero. It then could go to positive L, which would be plus one. Yeah. That is how many numbers right there? That is a total of three numbers. How many P orbitals are there in a subshell? Three. Each of those numbers represent one individual P orbital. Like this guy right here is the px orbital, that's the py orbital, and that's the pz orbital. And that, again, is why for p, we actually have three orbitals that make up a subshell, rather than for s's that we only have, obviously, one. Any questions on that there? By the way, for this guy, we could have an m sub s of, obviously, plus or minus one half in any of those orbitals. And we also can have an M sub S of plus or minus one half for any of these three orbitals that we got going on here. Also tells us really the orientation of those orbitals on the X, Y, and sort of Z axis. That is why, again, when we get to the N equals two, we have our two S orbital and our three P orbitals that make up the two P subshell. Question on that there. Now, I'll let you do it. N equals three, yeah? What are all the possible values for L, M sub L, and M sub S? So take a moment and complete zero to N minus one. Again, all sort of whole numbers there. That means when we're at an N equals three, which is the third energy level, we have values of zero, one, and two in this case, and it is three minus one is two, right? So that's where we max out. We have already seen that our zero is our S orbitals, right? So on the third energy level, we have our S orbital there, which is our three S orbital. We also saw that an L value of one represents the P subshell. So just like we talked about, we also will have a three P subshell hanging out there. And as you probably can imagine, our two would represent the D subshell. So that is where we first start to see the d orbitals first appear on the third energy level. Now, for each of these L values, as I mentioned before, you could do a m sub L, which is L to 0 to plus L. So we did some of these before, so we'll just kind of look at them really quickly here. m sub L for this 0 can only be 0. The m sub L for the 1 value gives us our 3 p orbitals there which is our px py and pz but now we'll kind of do the new one here our m sub l for our two means that we could go from minus two to minus one now to zero to plus one and plus two that is how many numbers that is five and that is what we have for d right so that is why we have five d orbitals to make up the subshell each of these numbers represent basically a D subshell as you go across it. Now for everybody here in any of these individual orbitals, you could have plus or minus a half for the spin quantum numbers in this case. 
So this again is why when we get to the third energy level, we still have our 3S, we still have a 3P, and again, this is where we start to see our 3D orbitals basically start to appear. Any questions on that there? All right, we'll lay it up there 